You don't see John Corvino around much since same-sex marriage was legalized across the United States. And that's a shame because he's a very impressive speaker and debater and I'd like to see more of him. Here's a debate he did with Maggie Gallagher in 2012. There are gay people in the world. They are our friends and neighbors, our fellow students, our family members, our fellow citizens. Second, gay people find happiness in same-sex relationships. You might not like it, you might not even understand it, but so it goes. Third, when they find that happiness, it does not take anything away from you. This is why I think many of the people who oppose gay rights are motivated by sadism. This is obviously not true of all opponents of gay rights, but it's clear to me that many simply don't like gay people and want them to suffer. It does not take anything away from you. Giving marriage to gay people does not mean taking it away from straight people. It's not like there's a limited number of marriage licenses and once we run out of them, they're gone. Phyllis Schlafly used to argue that recognizing same-sex marriage harms traditional marriage because it equates the two as equal and that doing so is an insult to marriage. I've heard others argue that if gay couples are allowed to get married, then straight men will see marriage as gay and be less motivated to get married. These are both problems, assuming they are legitimate, caused by anti-gay bigotry rather than gay marriage. Relationships are good for people. This is something, actually, that I don't think we spend enough time talking about. People say, oh, it makes you happy. Yes, but it's not just about the subjective pleasure of it. <clears throat> a relationship can get us outside of ourselves, can help us grow at its best. It can be an avenue toward making us better people. When we have someone to come home to at night, to wake up with in the morning, to share life's joys and sorrows and challenges with, to commit to for better or for worse until death do we part, this is good for people. This is an argument that folks who call themselves pro-marriage often use. If this is what they believe, why would they want to discourage consenting adults from involving themselves in such relationships? If relationships, especially marriages, really have these benefits, why exclude people who will never be able to form romantic attachments to anyone who is not of their own sex? People might say, yeah, the relationships, they make people happy, but what's in it for society? And one thing I'd say in response to that is, well, gay people are a part of our society. Remember, they're friends and neighbors and family members and so on, and anything that helps them but doesn't take anything away from anyone else is a gain to society. But there's more to it than that. Because happy, stable couples make happy, stable neighbors. When there's someone whose job it is to take care of you and vice versa, that means that your neighbor and that the state is less likely to have to do that. So in my view, this is a kind of win-win situation. It's good for the couples themselves, but also good for society at large because society has an interest in promoting and encouraging this kind of stable commitment for all of its members, gay and straight alike. It's ironic that conservatives, especially the ones who drone on about the importance of family, want to discourage gay folks from forming familial relationships with their partners. It's even more ironic that this might make gay folks more likely to become dependent upon the state welfare system. Well, some people say if we allow same-sex couples to marry, that will be a threat to traditional marriage. I've been doing this for a long time. Honestly, I don't get this argument. Do we think that if we support gay people in their relationships, People will stop having straight relationships and all go gay. <laughs> the usual response to a gay person is not, hey, no fair. <laughs> Since there are religious folks who claim that everyone deals with sinful same-sex attractions, and that condemnation of homosexuality is necessary to help people fight these attractions, it wouldn't surprise me at all if there are some opponents of same-sex marriage who do think, hey, no fair, in reaction to the prospect of gay marriage. How come he gets to be gay? Do we think that if we support same-sex marriage, straight people will give up on the institution of marriage? What's that dinner conversation going to look like? Well, Jane, I wanted to marry you, but now the guys next door are getting married, so forget it. <laughs> This sounds funny, but there are people who actually think this way. In Australia, there's a couple threatening to get divorced if same-sex marriage is legalized there. But the favorite argument of opponents of same-sex marriage is, what about the children? They are convinced that same-sex couples simply cannot raise children as well as opposite-sex couples. When we compare intact same-sex couples with intact different-sex couples controlling for other variables, we find the children do just as well either way. 
You don't have to take my word for that. The American Academy of Pediatrics has said the same thing. If you don't believe them, how about the American Psychological Association, the National Association of Social Workers, the Child Welfare League of America, the American Medical Association, every major health and welfare organization that has commented on this issue has said the same thing. The children, there don't appear to be marked differences between the two cases. What seems to matter most is stability. As long as kids have adults who are consistently part of their lives throughout their upbringing, that's what seems to matter most. The reaction I sometimes hear to studies that say this is either it's too soon to tell, or the APA has been taken over by cultural Marxists, or some other such hand-waving dismissal. But suppose you disagree. Suppose you think that all of those organizations are wrong, and that that is the optimal situation for childbearing. The conclusion about same-sex marriage still would not follow. Why? Because same-sex marriage never takes children away from competent biological parents who want them. However, denying same-sex marriage to same-sex couples who already raise children relegates those children to being raised by an unmarried couple. If you believe that children are best raised by a married opposite-sex couple, don't you think they would be better raised by a married same-sex couple than an unmarried same-sex couple? It's not that by letting me marry, you give me license to kidnap children from their own biological parents. <laughs> so in a way, I think we're asking the wrong question. The question is not, where do kids do better in same-sex families or in different sex families? The question is, would allowing same-sex couples to marry improve child welfare or hurt child welfare? And prohibiting same-sex couples to marry is not going to mean that any more children get the intact biological family that's supposed to be optimal. No more children are going to get that just because we prohibit same-sex couples to marry. But what will happen is that all of the children who are currently being raised by same-sex couples, couples who often give them homes, take them out of foster care when they're difficult to place, do not get the security and support of marriage. What is marriage? Is there a reason why marriage is defined as, understood as, rooted in the phenomenon of male-female sexual, romantic, and social attraction? Does it, what purpose does thinking about marriage in this way serve? More specifically, I think you should be addressing what purpose is served by thinking of marriage exclusively this way. If there is a purpose to thinking of marriage in terms of heterosexual attraction, why is that purpose undermined by thinking of it also in terms of homosexual attraction? And uh, so it's not a circular argument. It is not simply marriage is defined this way, therefore we can't think about it. What I believe is that marriage is the union of husband, the short version, marriage is the union of husband and wife for a reason. And yes, it's because these are the unions that we all count on to make new life. The only unions that can, can connect a child in love to their mother and father. And how is that in any way undermined by recognizing same-sex marriage? How does recognizing same-sex marriages disconnect children from their mother and father? And if it does, and we must forbid same-sex marriages because they don't produce children, why does nobody argue against granting a marriage license to a postmenopausal woman? I got into this gay marriage debate in a bit unusual way. Um, back in 1982, when I was a senior at Yale and a pro-life atheist, I got pregnant. Um, and so I had my uh, first son, uh, his father was a Yale student, a year younger than me, and I was very concerned that I'd not interfere with his education. Um, so we kind of kind of scuttled along and I, uh, my parents supported me and I tried to figure out how to uh, work and take care of my son. Um, and then in three years later, four years later, he was about, he was about three years old, in 1986, um, my son's father called me up and said uh, that it was just too much for him, he couldn't take it anymore, which was kind of puzzling to me because frankly he wasn't really doing very much. Um, <laughs> but anyway, as I said, that was 86 and neither my son nor I have seen or heard from him since. I can see why that would make you want people to take marriage very seriously, but I don't see why this would make you oppose gay marriage. Imagine if what happened to you happened to a bisexual woman who, after being divorced by the father of her child, settled in with a woman who initially committed to help raising that child, but then decided to abandon her as well, and who never even had to bother with a divorce because they were never permitted to get married in the first place. Can you not see how someone with this experience would want both opposite-sex marriages and same-sex marriages to be taken seriously? How 
does granting recognition to one reduce the gravity with which people regard the other? And um, I kind of started thinking about, because of my own experience, and because of my experience with the sun, and two things became clear to me very fast. The first is that it's really hard to raise children on your own. So why would you want to keep gay folks with kids from marrying their partners? And, um, uh, t you know, I, I, could, I believe that every child who's raised without his mother and father has two big questions, even those that do fine and are, do well, that they have to wrestle with. Um, the first is, uh, since most of these children are raised by their mothers, and like my son, lose their fathers, um, what does male love feel like? What is its relationship to me? Why the fuck would they assume that male parental love would feel different from female parental love? And why, even if there were some difference, would this question produce some disturbing existential angst? Is love a feminine characteristic? And what does that mean for me as a, as a girl or for me as a boy? They process it differently. And the second question that's not hard to get theological fast is that children ask themselves is why is it that one half of the people who made me doesn't seem to love me. What does that say about me? What does that say about love and its relationship to creation and the universe? Gallagher talks about being raised by someone other than one's biological parents as though it produces some horrible, disturbing, Kafka-esque identity crisis. One that is apparently so severe that it somehow justifies denying marriage licenses to same-sex couples. Not everyone who is raised without their biological father or without their biological mother feels unloved as a result. If your biological father was a sperm donor, why would you expect him to love you? Why would you ask, what does that say about me? This would only be asked by someone who inferred that the absence of their biological father implies that there is something wrong with them. If the reason your biological father doesn't love you is because he never met you, or perhaps never even met your mother, why would you infer that this lack of love has anything to do with you? Are there really a lot of kids conceived by sperm donation asking, why doesn't the guy who jerked it into a cup for money love me? And more importantly, what the fuck does this have to do with gay marriage? Even if it is the case that children who grow up with absent biological parents are somehow injured by this, same sex marriage would not be the cause of this injury. It would be the result of biological parents giving their children up for adoption, donating sperm, or serving as a surrogate mother. Banning gay marriage is not going to stop these things. These things would still exist even if there were not one single homosexual on the planet. If Maggie Gallagher is really worried about children growing up without their biological parents, why do I not see her or her like-minded conservatives calling for the restriction of adoption? I know many religious folks are against surrogacy and sperm donation, but but I don't see them clamoring for laws against them as zealously as they fight gay marriage. Why is this? If the absence of biological parents is what concerns them the most, then this should be their first priority. The fact that I don't see them campaigning against these things as vocally as they campaign against same-sex marriage makes this argument look disingenuous to me. So here's how marriage protects children. It is not that there's a bunch of benefits that the government gives you that trickle down and protect the children. Marriage protects children because every time a man and a woman who are attracted to the opposite sex marry, that act itself is protecting children because it means neither of them will be creating fatherless if they are true to their vows. Neither of them will be creating fatherless children across multiple households. And how does gay marriage undermine that? How do two men getting married or two women getting married cause fatherlessness? How does it undermine efforts to prevent fatherlessness? Maybe you think that allowing lesbian couples to get married will increase the demand for sperm donors, but if that's the case, your beef is really with sperm donation, not with same-sex marriage. The reason why, and here I have to say, this is a... Um, we're all entitled to our opinions of what marriage should be in the future. But the history of marriage in this country, the legal history of marriage, is littered with attestations that managing procreation so that children are not born out of wedlock in fatherless homes that hurt them and become a burden on the community, or at least are less likely to. And so the children are raised in homes that are more likely to be successful with the mother and father raising them together. This has been articulated as the purpose of marriage and law over and over. We didn't make it up because we don't like gay people. Even if that has been the purpose of the government's involvement in marriage, why must that be the only purpose? Why would adding a purpose undermine the already existing purpose? What happens if we change the norms and change the idea that there's something special about husbands and wives, that we have a stake in this relationship that we don't have as a, 
a communal state that we don't have in other kinds of relationships. Well, the first thing that's going to happen is that the law is going to repudiate what I think it should be strengthening. So, I mean, I really, this emerged for me as a practical problem. I was like, I'm going around the country making some progress because I'm saying marriage really matters because children need a mom and a dad. Now, when I go to, what happens if Massachusetts adopts gay marriage? What happens when I go there and I try to make the case that marriage really matters because children need a mom and a dad? Fucking nothing. The idea that marriage is important for more than just that reason in no way repudiates that reason. Gallagher seems to think that saying marriage is important for X and Y is contrary to saying marriage is important for X. That doesn't fucking follow. People are going to look up and they're going to say, well, that's not the purpose of marriage because same-sex couples are married, so obviously marriage has nothing to do with getting mothers and fathers for children. The only people I have ever heard make this complete non-sequitur of an argument are people who oppose same-sex marriage. You'd have to be a complete shithead to think that because not all marriages are procreative, marriage has nothing to do with procreation. This is like if you said hammers are the best tools for pounding nails, and someone responded, but I use my hammer for cracking nuts, therefore hammers have nothing to do with pounding nails. How do you not see how ridiculous this reasoning is. What are you talking about, Maggie? Right? And you can bring up the example of infertile couples, but I will guarantee you, again, as a matter of recent historical fact, that when I spent 20 years going around the country saying this, there is no one in the audience who ever raised the problem of infertile couples and said that repudiates the idea that marriage has something to do with bringing men and women to make and raise the next generation. That's because it doesn't follow for the exact same reason. I think that these, the, the classic understanding of marriage is not only going to be repudiated, it's going to be actively oppressed by law, culture, and society after same-sex marriage. Now, why do I think that? Because you're a paranoid bigot. Because I think the heart of the gay marriage idea goes something like this. There is no morally relevant difference between same-sex and opposite-sex couples when it comes to marriage and its purposes. And if you see a difference, there's something wrong with you. How does seeing the classic understanding of marriage as morally equal to same-sex marriages constitute the oppression of the idea of traditional marriages? You heard Maggie say when a child is born, a mother is likely to near be nearby. But men don't always stick around to care for their children. They sometimes leave. And we need this institution of marriage to keep the parents around, but particularly to pressure the fathers to stick around in order to care for their children, because children deserve to have both their father and their mother. Now, there are a couple things, I think, in reaction to this. One is it's sort of a very dismal view of men. Another is that it's kind of an impoverished view of marriage. But mainly it's, okay, so what does this have to do with gay people? How does allowing two men to marry each other exacerbate the problem of absentee fathers? And Maggie's answer to this is that essentially, as I understand it, and again, this might be a caricature, but I don't think so. If we accept that same-sex couples can be married, then marriage is no longer focused exclusively, or at least almost exclusively, on pressuring men to stick around for their offspring, but it's about something else. It's about adult sharing of life. It's about commitment, but without the biological connections. It's about love and happiness. It's about something, but not about that. And I think that Maggie is setting up a false dilemma. She seems to have an all-or-nothing view of marriage. Either marriage is only and exclusively about children, or it has nothing to do with them at all. Because actually, I agree with her that a very important function of marriage is to get people, particularly fathers, to stick around and care for their offspring. But how does it do this? It does this by saying that this person that you're committing to, you're committing to for keeps. This is serious, and we, your family and friends who stand around you, are going to hold you to it. Now, that's important for biological offspring. It's also important for offspring who are not biologically related to the parents, for other children who may be in the household. And frankly, it's also important for childless adults to have someone there for keeps. So basically what I want to say is, I think Maggie Gallagher has picked the wrong battle. 
that if the concern is really get fathers to stick around for their children, I'm right there with her. But there's still room for love and commitment and support for people who are not having children, including same-sex couples. 